Okay, let's do two more minutes and then get going. Just in the meantime, um, syllabus has been updated if you can look at it. I still have to send you an email about which groups come on Tuesday and which groups come on Thursday. I'm working on that. So the deadline today with some papers, so it's overcrowded. And I think that's it. You got your homework, you have one and a half weeks to two weeks time to do it. Shouldn't be too terrible, I believe. All right. Okay. Close the door. Outside noise. All right. So today, um, the progression of topics. So what we've been talking so far about was basic robotics, block diagrams, linear control, simple linear control, how to set it up, how to model a system, how to put in a little simple controller, PD controller, then slightly advanced stability analysis, and then we looked a little bit into less class transforms and frequency domain analysis because that's just a topic which people use a lot, which you should have heard about at least. You don't have to be experts at that. At this moment, you can always take a textbook and learn about it. Now, that's all beautiful since it's a linear system. Linear systems are unfortunately not so exciting, particularly not in the interesting world of robotics. So everything becomes nonlinear and much more complicated. And the moment it becomes nonlinear and much more complicated, we have to do an unfortunate amount of extra work to actually get them. Could you close the door, please? So just so you don't get too much noise from the back. And what we're going to do now in the next few lectures essentially go into all the little details of nonlinear modeling, which in the end allows you to create complicated nonlinear models of robots and then also nonlinear controllers. And that's really what we care about. Since nonlinear controllers are these days essential if you want to create a robot which is squishy, compliant, which can interact with the world in a safe and also in a way where the world is not perfectly modeled. And this is really the modern world of robotics. We're not so much interested in industrial robots, which are super heavy and super stiff and don't sense their environment and just basically either live or die. That's literally what that is. Now, it's going to be a little bit more dry. Fun. And it will take a moment, but you will see what comes out of it and why it's useful. In the end, I hope you will see actually on your now project why you need these things. You need to understand the ideas of kinematics, then what is called direct kinematics, inverse kinematics, and in the end, kind of uh, model of models of nonlinear equations for robotics control. We don't do this too much, but a couple of, of lectures before we get there. Today, we start with something which is fairly simple and dry. We start with coordinate transformations, but they are pain. And people always make mistakes in coordinate transformation. We need them all the time. And the whole idea is essentially, well, it's very easy to describe here. But if this is my world coordinate system, <coughs> sorry, x, y, z, for instance, and it's nice to, uh, to, to, to explain a point out here. It's just some coordinates. It becomes much more complicated <coughs> when I describe local coordinate systems on an arm and basically say, oh, if, if this marker is touching me here. Where is that actually on my arm? Or when I feel this point, where is that point out in space? These are actually the questions we need to answer. So otherwise, what we do with robots in the end, we interact with the real world. The real world in, in our primitive way of modeling is, is Cartesian, so X, Y, Z, and orientations on top later on. Um, but the robot world is about joint angles and joint coordinates, which are very different. So we need to relate these two things. And it's a little painful to do that, as you will notice. Um, but it's a very simple formalism in the end. And you will see it's all in your algebra. It's not too complicated. But it requires often that you sit down, do it slowly, do it carefully, graphically visualize things, and make sure that you don't make a mistake somewhere with signs and cosines and, 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 and errors, whatever. Good. So this is the topic today of coordinate transformation. We just will talk about 
how to basically go from one coordinate system to another coordinate system where we basically have to translate and rotate and basically model any point which we would like to model. And there's different conventions, Euler angles, fixed angles for orientations, and there's near something which is called homogeneous transformations, and that's kind of that kind of stuff. Now, this is a topic which is really nicely covered in the book. And whenever something is nicely covered in the book, I don't reproduce the slides. Actually, I use some parts of the book. So it's much nicer. And here we go. So chapter two on, where's my mouse? Okay, here we go on kinematics in Siciliano. And this is really worthwhile reading. He develops it very nicely, very clean, very, very nice notation, nothing to worry about. So how do we get started? We get started the easiest with this figure. And I'll just reproduce that so we have that on the whiteboard as well. So what we need to do is we need a world coordinate system, okay, that's easy. And let me see that I do it roughly the same as he does, x, y, z. And we call this, for instance, O for the world coordinate system. So this is it. And you choose those guys, OK? It's up to you where you choose. You can choose the corner of your room, or you can choose the tabletop, or whatever it is. Someone needs to define the world. In, well, outside in the world, we have GPS these days, which tells us where we are. And then there is another coordinate system, which is out here. And whoops, let's do this. This is x prime, this is y prime, and this is z prime. Okay, and we call this coordinate system O prime. So this is a local coordinate system. This local coordinate system is different from this. It is translated and it's rotated out there. Okay, and we just want to basically see how we can relate these two things to each other. Small rule, please do not forget. We work with right-handed coordinate systems. Right-handed coordinate systems are simple. Thumb sticks into the x direction. Your index finger into the y direction, and your middle finger then sticks automatically up into the z direction. That's a right-handed coordinate system. I do apologize, but if you're a left-handed person and do it with your left hand, it doesn't work. Then it becomes a left-handed coordinate system. So you've got to be using your right hand. And when you do math, and write something down, and because you have your pen in your right hand and do everything with your left hand, you screw up everything. Left-handed coordinate systems would be just fine. There's nothing wrong with them, okay? There's just a convention that people like to use right-handed coordinate system, and if that is discrimination against left-handed people, I deeply apologize, but I cannot change it. It's like inches and stuff like that. Someone came up with it, and now we got stuck with it. Good. And we can basically imagine that this coordinate system here is actually connected to something, some body. This is this guy. It's a fine potato if you want to, or whatever is floating out in space. But somehow this coordinate system is stuck to it, okay? It's not moving around, it's stuck. That's the point. What we care about essentially if there is a point here in this coordinate system, how can we express it in this world coordinate system? Or vice versa, if there's a point outside here, it can be expressed in this local coordinate. Okay, so that's the generic picture which we're going to need. Um, so how can the position of a point O prime on the rigid body with respect to the coordinate system O? So how can we express it? Well, there's different ways. So you can basically look at this O prime position and try to express it and project it onto the axis X, Y, and Z. Projection is actually something you know in case you needed to do that. In inner product, remember? So if you have a vector x, inner product with y, this is a projection of the vector x onto the vector y. But if you have a vector y, the unit vector, as our coordinate systems usually have, they have unit vectors, so you get exactly the length of the vector x as when it's projected to something like a coordinate y. Okay? So we'll need these inner products a lot. Fine. So we have basically now, uh, if you want to express O prime, let me see how we do this. Then 
point to prime is basically just modeled as a vector as <coughs> O prime x, O prime y, O prime z. And these are the coordinates basically of O projected on those two different x, y, and z coordinates. Not particularly quite. Okay, so this is essentially the vector which we are modeling this way. Here's it. Okay. So this is all very straightforward, not too complicated. Um, now, a next step we can do is we can also try to express all the um, local coordinate system x prime in the world coordinate system. Okay, that would be the same thing. We can basically take x prime and project it on x. We can x is a vector. Remember, we can take y prime projected on x, and you can take z prime projected on x, and then we do everything with the other things as well. It basically gives us a representation of these vectors in this um, world coordinate system. Okay? So this is actually shown here. So we have x prime expressed in the world coordinate system. It's basically the coordinate of x prime times x, then x y plus y, x m times z. And the same for y prime, the next one for z prime. And what the nice thing is essentially, this in the end, if you have basically a projection of each of those coordinate axes onto the world coordinate system, you can summarize that in what we really care about, and this is what is called a rotation point. So we get rid of this, and this is what we care. So R, the rotation matrix here, is going to be essentially the inner product of x prime transpose on the x-axis of y prime transpose on the y-axis, no, sorry, on the x-axis, z prime transpose on the x-axis, and then we repeat all of this stuff by projecting this on the y-axis, y prime transpose on the y-axis, um, z prime transpose on the y-axis, and the last thing we do everything with z. And z prime transpose on <coughs> This basically, this now basically takes this x-axis in a product is on x. It gives us the coordinate, the x-coordinate of the vector x prime in world coordinates uh, in x direction. So it's complicated. So we give it necessarily nine numbers. So that is just the projection of x prime on x. Then we have y prime on x. Have I done this right? Yes, so okay, good. All right, let me then go down with it. So then we have x prime goes on y and x prime goes on z. So these are the three coordinates. So I basically could take this picture here, x prime, and now I would could basically take this point and would make a could make a projection on it, then this would work. But the point is right now we gave up on that kind of translation. We only look at what is this vector if it were just expressed in this local in the in the world coordinate system. So well, let me see, I could for instance take x prime draw it here, okay, and then basically look at the coordinates. Now, this is complicated to draw, to me, since it's supposed to be 3D. So we could have this, for instance, it's going down, so we would have to go a little bit up, then we would have to go in this direction, we have to go down, we have to go in this direction, this direction, this direction. Oops. I'm not sure whether this is useful, but let me try. So here's the guy. Okay, it doesn't come out so well. So basically, the vector, if you basically project it, if you, if you think of it in a, in a rectangular box, so this corner here projected on all these axes, this is really what this first vector of the rotation matrix tells us. Okay, and the other ones are just the same. Get rid of this. Very confusing. Okay. 
So this rotation matrix is something which we will need a lot. Very important, rotation matrices have certain properties because we work with right-handed coordinate systems where all the um, coordinate axes are perpendicular to each other. That basically holds all the time. So if you have, for instance, the vector x prime transpose y prime, they are orthogonal, so the inner product has to be zero. The same is true for y transpose z times z transpose x prime. So these are matrices which are built from a right-handed coordinate system, unit vectors, and all the vectors are orthogonal to each other. So these matrices have very special properties. One of the things is basically the determinant, if we would go back to our linear algebra initially, the determinant would be one. These, these, these matrices can only rotate things. They cannot stretch anything. <coughs> so they are purely rotation matrices. That's why we call them rotation matrices, not stretch matrices. Good. Fine. We have, in general, that the, we look at these um, X prime components that multiply with each other. They are one because these are two vectors which are basically parallel to each other. And then come some nice properties. So one property is that the rotation matrix transpose times itself equals identity. And you could basically just basically try to prove that. Right? So you're taking the transpose, multiplying with the cell, and you will figure out that you just get an identity with the cell. Okay? And if that is the case, remember the definition of an inverse. That means essentially that in this particular case, R transpose equals the same as R inverse. So that's also important. Inverses of rotation matrices are trivial. It's just transpose. You don't have to do any work. Very straightforward to be used. Good. I think you're happy with a rotation matrix. You look solidly happy. Yes. Um, the last question. This one. Uh, we only use right-handed. We only use right-handed. Left-handed people are excluded from life today. Sorry, just for convenience, so that we don't collide with the robot in the wrong way. Yes. Isn't R going to be an identity matrix itself? R is not going to be an identity matrix. So look at this. Basically, this is only in, in very special cases. If created from X prime transpose times X, that would only become one if X prime and X would be identical. That means if the two coordinate systems are literally aligned then you're right. Then the rotation matrix between of them is, is identity. That means there is nothing to be rotated. Cool. So what do we have to do now? Elementary rotations. So here's the fun part. All of you are OK when it comes to thinking in terms of translating between here and there. All of you are pretty much pathetic when it comes to kind of describing how a coordinate system which is here, let's take here my one coordinate system and a coordinate system which is here, how to rotate this thing to get into this. Sure, I can align them if I do this properly, but it, it, it's not trivial for me. I have to look a lot in order to make this work, how to align them. The, and, and what I'm going to do, the rotation I'm going to do, is not the shortest path how to rotate. I'm just pathetic. I just rotate my way away. It turns out the easiest way to think about things like this is actually, okay, let's say we have this thing here. So how can I match it up with there? Well, how about I do multiple simple rotations, which I understand. Like, I, for instance, I understand this rotation quite nicely. That works. Um, Okay, and I have this lens, I make this a little bit more tilted. Okay, now I have to rotate this a little bit like this, and now they are aligned in rotation. So I kind of composed it out of simpler rotations, which I can understand because these rotations align with some kind of reference in the world, which is easy to understand. Okay, and that's the idea of about elementary rotations. And let's go to those a little bit. <coughs> And this 
can be nicely derived to take a picture, which makes sense how this works. Essentially, what we care about is, and we do this now in a in a two D course, so it's going to make our lives a little bit easier. So this is currently going to be x, this is going to be y, and z, x, y, z. So z has to stick out. People often want to draw this by making this an arrow which you look from the top. So if you think about an arrow to look like this, okay, if you look on it from the top, it would look like a point and a circle. And if we look at it from the back, well, it's fine. I have to make this first. It's a proper arrow, so we need to go watch Robin Hood or something like that, kind of refresh your fairy tale. And if you look at it from the back, you would see the feathers. And this would be what done as a cross. Okay, this is just a convention. Not everybody uses it, but many people do. It's so fun. Okay. Now, what we are going to take, so this is our x, y coordinate system. And now we take a, um, I just want to go for the basics. So now we take our rotated coordinate system which is x prime, <coughs> y prime, okay? That's all supposed to be unit vectors for the moment. And between the x axis and the x prime axis, we have a rotation angle of alpha. Now the question is, okay, how can I express the rotation between x prime or the prime coordinate system and the non-prime coordinate system um, based on alpha? Right? Fine, you can be right back. That's not so hard. What we're going to do is we basically do this again, vector by vector, the same thing as what we did before. We can do a little graph. So we look at x prime projected down here, okay? And we want to know what is the length of x prime here. So that's not so hard. So this is x prime here x prime times cosine alpha. Okay, that would be alpha. Then we project here. This is x prime times sine alpha. All right, and then we have y prime. We're going to project this down. Same thing. Goes here. And we get basically y prime, this area here on, on, on y is y prime times cosine alpha, while this here is y prime times sine alpha. Okay, so that means from this you can get actually the rotation matrix fairly straightforwardly and say the rotation here has to look like the following. First thing, the z coordinate doesn't change, so we can put a one in there. <laughs> Don't care about that. And then we basically have to pick a pair. So, okay, x prime times cosine alpha, so the cosine goes here. Then, aha, uh -huh, here's something which potentially went wrong. That is y prime is actually minus sine alpha, since it's pointing in the negative direction. <coughs> minus sine alpha, and then we get here sine alpha times cosine alpha. And what you basically think about is essentially that r multiplied times the vector x prime y prime has to be the x y coordinates. Okay, see whether this works. We basically have x prime here, then we have get x prime, prime times cosine alpha multiplied. We just have to put a zero in here as well. So. so x prime times cosine alpha, y prime times minus sine alpha. So this is what we have here. And zero times zero goes away. And then x prime times sine alpha, which we have up here. And y prime times cosine alpha. So this is 
can multiply this out and get exactly this relationship. Does it make sense? So this is just basically telling you how to take x prime and rotate it into the xy coordinate system. So this is a elementary rotation about the z-axis, okay? This is what this rotation matrix looks like. And now we could do exactly the same things and look at it. So what happens if I do a rotation about the y-axis? What do is I do a rotation about the x-axis? So what would be happening is now I would have to basically go in here, get rid of this, I start basically not calling this x anymore. I call this, for instance, now y, and call this here z, and derive the entire story again. Except I have to pay attention to my definition. So let me just clean this out just to make sure that we get this across properly. So this one coordinate system we started with here it was x, y, Z. Now we can do, let's do X, Z. Now if this is X and Z, then let me see, X goes here, Z goes up. This means Y actually has to be sticking into the whiteboard. So you gotta be pay, pay, pay attention then, it means what's important. A positive rotation is always a rotation where you stick your thumb in the direction of the arrow and your fingers, again, the right hand, sorry, the fingers curl in the direction where it's positive. So this here was a positive rotation, which was fine. We used alpha like this. Now, in this case, if you rotate in this direction, that would be negative because the arrow sticks inside. Okay? So actually now, for this guy, this here is positive. And if you do this for the last coordinate system, actually it's like this again. It's nicer. But what happens essentially is you get these elementary rotation matrices. This is the one which we derived. Now the y is what I just basically showed you where they're rotating about y. So this is the y-axis. Because the arrow is sticking into the whiteboard, the sign, the, the, the negative sign on the sign function flips. It's, instead of being up here, it is down there. You have always the one on the axis of rotation, okay? This is the y-axis. You're rotating about 0, 1, 0 in a positive way. And then if you look at the rotation about the x-axis, it looks the same as this one, just that everything has been shifted so that you have the rotation about the x-axis, 1, 0, 0. And this is the little rotation we do about it. OK? So just these three things are your friends. You just at some point know them by heart, and you know that if you rotate about y, there's basically you have to flip the sign on the sine function. The sine on the sine function is complicated. All right, so now we have three elementary rotations. We can rotate about x, we can rotate about y, and about z. We should call, people call this alpha for the z-axis, beta for the y-axis, and gamma for the x-axis. It's just a convention. Happy? Yes. I told you it's dry. Good. Fine, this is essentially what we just basically referred to. And, oh, this is, let me see, but this goes to another thing. There is one more, this should be the picture a little bit later. And uh, let me double check. Which, which, which figure does it refer to? Ah, no. Oops, that was totally wrong. Where is it? Okay, fine. I'm just screwing up. How could I just... I've never done that before. How could I just switch my desktop? Go away. What gesture did I do? That's embarrassing. Okay, fine. Here we go. We're back. Good. Um, one simple relationship which is shown here is that the rotation matrix of a particular angle, alpha, 
minus 1 can also be written as the rotation of minus alpha. Okay? And you can basically look at this because we've got to be put these minus alpha in the corner of cosine and sine function. You see exactly how things change, and you see how you end up with a transpose function automatically. Okay, so that was what in here with my mouse pointer. Good. Fine. Now, the next component is just becoming a touch more complicated, but not really a math lot. Um, so far, we just basically talked about um, rotating the local coordinate system into the uh, global coordinate system. Now we basically look at a point on the coordinate system. So we basically, we don't just care about, let me draw this again. So here was my world coordinate system, x, y, z. Here was my local coordinate system. And we just basically talked about how to basically transform the individual coordinate axis into the world coordinate system. Next thing which becomes interesting to take entire points. The point out in space expressed in the local coordinate system or expressed in the global coordinate system. It's just a natural step forward. What to do. Good. So and this is beautifully shown here in this uh, graph. Let's see whether I can explain it and see if it works for you. Okay, again, we don't look at the translation part, this, this part here of the coordinate system, we'll add in a few minutes. We'll just look at the rotation part. So right now, the prime coordinate system, if you look at Z prime, Y prime, and X prime, they are, the coordinate system is coinciding with the X, Y, Z coordinate system, just as a rotation between the two of them. And we're interested in taking this point P and expressing it either in the local coordinate system or in the global coordinate system. Okay? Fine. And basically we get in this way two points. We get the point P expressed in local coordinates. And we get the point P expressed in the global coordinates. Okay? And fine, if you want to express P in local coordinates, that's essentially P prime. That is its local representation. So if you just basically have that prime coordinate system here again, and there's the point P. If you just basically take the vector which goes to the point P, which may be this vector, and project it down on each of those axes appropriately, whatever, uh, you get the P prime representation. So that would basically be P prime X, P prime Y, P prime. So that's pretty. This is just expressing the vector in its local coordinates. Now, what does it take to get it down? Well, all we're going to do is to take our friend the rotation matrix, which tells us how to get the coordinate axis from the prime coordinate system in the main coordinate system and multiply it with it. And that basically now inner product uh, these coordinate components on all the axes of x, y, and z, and you get finally this basically representation of the point in global coordinate systems. Okay. So this here is what we really care about in the end. That P equals R times P prime. And now you can also do fun things. If you want to invert that, if you want to basically figure out if you have a peer point P in global coordinate system, what would be its location in the local coordinate system? Well, you can just say P prime equals R minus 1 times P. And R minus 1, as we know, is actually just the transpose, so it's a little bit simpler than taking the input. And so now this is just now useful. So what we care about, for instance, like 
you have in your hand here, and you want to grasp this, this marker. So it's very natural to, to basically express this marker in hand coordinate systems, for instance. But in the end, you need to know where is this marker in the world coordinate system. Or maybe you have just a camera sensor which senses where this, uh, where this marker is in hand coordinate system, and you want to know where is it in the world. And with these transformations, we can go from this representation in hand coordinates to a representation. Actually, we can go into a representation on any intermediate coordinate system we would like to define. So we can basically say, oh, from, from the elbow's point of view, this thing is here. From a shoulder point of view, it's here. From my body's point of view, it's here. And it really depends what, what you care about. So many sensors which we're going to have, for instance, are sometimes only in world coordinate systems or they're sometimes in local coordinate systems. So they measure something in a particular coordinate system, but you want, might want to get it in another coordinate system. So you have to transform it back and forth. This is basically the simple recipe how this works. You need these rotation matrices. Okay. So fine. Do I want to go through that? Not really. This is just basically doing the deriv derivation of if you have a point here in a local coordinate system x prime, y prime, how basically if you look at p in prime coordinates, this is just the projection down on the axis and y coordinates. If you want to basically see what is it in the uh, global coordinate system, you basically would take the projection here, but now you have to basically then calculate how, what's, what is this length and what is the projected length here. And you come up with a rotation matrix. I can show you this one time, maybe for fun. Um, just verifying that we end up with rotation matrices again. <coughs> so this is this example. Here's the x, here's the x prime coordinate system. This is the y prime coordinate system, and this is y. Here's again our angle alpha. Again, this is the vector z which sticks out. And now you have a point here. Correct? <coughs> okay. And we're caring about this and this axis. And what we really want in the end, so this is our p x prime and p y prime coordinates. But what we want to see is what would it be in world coordinate systems. So that here would be p x and p y. Now we can see whether we can calculate that potentially based on our knowledge of we only know x prime and we know y prime. Okay, so how would you be doing that? I just showed you this one axis is for fun. So you take you need to figure out where is this point. You just look at triangle geometry. So you take this point, project it down here, and says, okay, p x prime times cosine alpha. It basically is this part. But actually, I want to be here, so it's a little bit too long. But I have to subtract with actually this component to get there. Now, if you do triangle geometry, you also know that this here is alpha again. So in this line, we know this here is actually Py prime. So if you do subtract Py prime times sine alpha, then we got this point. Okay? And you would basically find out if you do the same exercise in order to get Py, you get Px prime times sine alpha plus p y prime times cosine alpha. Now, if you see that, as, then you see our good old friend, the rotation matrix, the elementary rotation matrix about the z-axis. Cosine, minus sine, sine, cosine. So if I would just let's do this here, totally pull this out and make this vector matrix rotation, Minus sign here, so then this here becomes in 2D my rotation matrix, and I get this P x prime here and P y, P 
key drive prime there at the back. And we just recovered our good old friend the rotation matrix one more time. So you can derive also rotation matrices, elementary rotation matrix from this entire argument and see how things get trapped up. It's kind of triangle geometry you need um, frequently when you do these kind of computations. Okay, good. So now we can essentially now we know elementary rotation matrix about x, y, and z axis. We know rotation matrix in general. They are friendly little guys. They are easy to invert to the transpose. And we know now how to express points which are in one coordinate system with the help of the rotation matrix in another coordinate system. So it's great. We're making perfect progress. Fine. Um, rotation of a vector. Now you can basically, there's basically two thing ways how you can think about what a rotation matrix is doing and either basically transforming a representation from one coordinate system to another coordinate system. You can also think about if you want to that a rotation matrix would transform the vector x prime into x that means it rotates the entire coordinate system and, and rotates you through the world. So there's different interpretations what you want. The one is a, is a change of coordinates, the other one is like I get rotated somewhere. So if you write something a vector p prime gets rotated by r into p, that is basically saying okay my vector was originally So my vector was originally here, and now I basically transform it with alpha down here. It's another way how you can think about what rotation matrices are doing. So all the same thing, it's just a change of coordinate systems and then in, in the way of how to interpret it. So it's just explaining those things and showing this is the same thing as before. Now, next thing is what becomes usually annoying to chain rotations. So we basically talked about elementary rotations because they're easy to understand. And if I wanted to do this little example where I showed you how to transform this, this, this little expunger here into another orientation, I have to go through a sequence of rotations. And there are some annoying components. So that is worthwhile keeping track of. Good. So now we do a more formal notation. Get rid of the primes, but rather give the, rotation, uh, the, the coordinate systems a number. So here is a vector p in coordinate system number two, and it gets transformed by a rotation matrix which takes two to coordinate system number one, and then that gives you a representation in coordinate system number one. Okay, not very really hard. So this two matches here, one is up there, and then the one matches back up there. It's just notation, so to make those, so we can do chains, it's a little bit nicer. And then you can do change, okay, we have P1, which gets rotated to zero, then P2, we want to rotate into zero, and uh, you can basically rotate P2 first into the coordinate system one. So for instance, P2 goes from rotation matrix two to one into P1, so I wrote it again, and now I basically want to rotate it into zero coordinate system, well, then I have to just rotate it a one more time from one to zero. I can make this equal sign correct. I have to do this as well. From, oops, from one to zero. Zero. Where is zero? This is zero. And I'm getting a representation of P zero. So just basically two to one, one to zero, puts me into the zero coordinate. We just chain things. It's not very hard. But it's important that you do the right sequence, and you will see that in a second. Okay, so this is a little bit the misery of life. Sequences of, remember, you know that matrices 
if you meet multiply matrix A with B or B with A is not the same. So that means something A times B is not the same as B times A. Okay? The same is true for rotation matrices, unfortunately. So sequence matters. And that's kind of shown here in this example. And what we're going to do here is basically we try to do elementary rotations of an object. And here's my object. And see where it ends up. So we start in this orientation. And we rotate about the z axis. Okay, So stick up my finger. This is positive. And let's do 90 degrees. Boop. So we got this picture here. And then, but we rotated actually the coordinate system with us. Okay. So we kept the coordinate system stuck to the body. So now y points in this direction is called y prime. x prime points in this direction. z prime has not been changed. Now we rotate about y prime again. Not again for the first time. And that would basically be, now think about this, this would actually be doing this. And so we end up with this orientation. And now you start kind of getting annoyed because you have to think about these kind of rotations. And let's do the same story one more time. So we start in the same position this time. So we just do, the, we do a change. We first rotate about y, and then we rotate about z. So here now we rotate about y, which brings us down here. Now z is sticking in this direction, and then we rotate about z, puts us in this position. We have this position versus this position, which is not the same. OK? That's annoying. But that is just life. This is what rotation matrices do. When we are rotating, actually, about whenever we rotate such that our next rotation is about the local coordinate system, we call these actually Euler angle rotation. This is just a convention. And there's also another convention. And you see it comes on the next page, where we always rotate about the global coordinates. So now let's do the same game again here. So we start here. Now we rotate about z, puts us here. Um, but now we rotate not about the local y. We rotate about the original world coordinate y. Okay? Go down this, and we have this thing. And we can try this again, but then maybe in this kind of a representation, um, we, we have three of problems. We go here. Now we rotate about y first downward like this. We'll put this into this. Now we rotate about the world coordinate z this way. Again, the darn thing looks different. This one was this, this one was this. So it doesn't help. Sorry. This convention is called a fixed angle rotation. And basically, if someone tells you, I have a body here, and then I did a rotation, alpha, beta, gamma, you actually, this guy has to tell you a little bit more. Has to tell you whether the person used Euler angle notation or fixed angle notation. It means that alpha is our rotation about the z axis, then beta is our rotation about the y, but did he mean the global coordinate y or the local coordinate y? So you need to know about that. Otherwise, you don't know what he did. Good. See, was there anything important before? No. Um, these are just normal rotations with transpose. Nothing has changed. Not particularly exciting. We can chain long rotations, 1, 0, 2, 1, k. It's this. Fine. L Let me see. There's one more component to basically note. In order to rotate an object from here to there, for instance, 
there's many different ways how you can do it with element orientations. There is not just one alpha, beta, gamma sequence. There may be an alpha, beta, alpha sequence. There may be a gamma, gamma, alpha, and a gamma, gamma equation sequence, or gamma, beta, alpha, or whatever. So there is no unique way of how you rotate about elementary orientations or rotations into a particular body, which is also annoying. So what people then often do in the end is basically they tell you what kind of, if they rotate, you usually need three rotations in order to get from a particular orientation of one body to another one, so it's a three-dimensional world. But people then really have to tell you, I've been rotating Euler angle alpha, <laughs> beta, alpha for me, that exists, or some other conventions. And there's basically a bunch of possibilities what you could be doing. So um, that's annoying. Actually, your rotations are plain annoying, and we'll skip them as much as possible in this course, since you would just be sitting there and have knots in your fingers. Um, the right thing to do rotations is actually with quaternions, but quaternions are way more abstract. And I, right now, I don't want to go into this level of abstraction, but here's actually the essence of a quaternion. Let's just go into this. This is actually useful to, to, to think about. A nicer way of thinking about rotations is essentially that I have a body here and I want to rotate it somehow and I think about how about I define a unit vector which is my rotation axis and I rotate about this rotation axis by a certain angle alpha. Okay? Okay, this is much nicer. It's kind of a little bit more intuitive to think about which is not as intuitive to express it. So we can, however, express it by just knowing our rotation matrices. And what you would be doing, okay, this is like we've shown in this plot. Um, you would basically take this convention y x, z, and here is my basically axis of rotation, which I would like to use, r. It's a unit vector, and I would like to rotate about that angle, okay, about this axis. And how do I get about doing this? And it's a little bit annoying. Um, you basically have to go and trans form the rotation about this angle into something you can manage. What you do is you take this rotation axis, and since we are only simple people, we can only do elementary orientation, we align it with one of the other axes so that we can do a simple rotation. So for that purpose, you just have to take that rotation axis and transform it until it aligns with something else. So what we're going to do is actually we're going to align it with Z. You could also use X or Y. That doesn't matter. It's up to you. Lots of arbitrariness. So how do you do that? Well, we at least have some knowledge about rotation matrices. You see that I can recreate the plot over there step by step. Okay. So if we could, first of all, project this vector down into this plane. Is this is what I'm going to do? Yes. Let me see. What am I aligning with? Just to make sure. Am I aligning with Z in this guy or with alpha, then beta? Okay. Double checking what he's going to do. Hmm. Yes, so it goes about alpha, beta, and then gamma, okay? So he first rotates about alpha. Okay, good. I got it to the right convention. So let's get this out. Don't do this first. We basically project this down and say, okay, this angle here 
is a rotation about the z-axis, which we call alpha. And then, we basically, what we would be getting is this vector rotated about g z. It would suddenly be in the x z plane. It would be something like this sticking out. This would be here my r prime. And then I know the angle between here and z and I rotate it up there, that would be a rotation about the y-axis, which would be my beta angle. Okay, a little abstract. Interesting. So, and then I just have to calculate what these angles are. So much fun. So, alpha, basically, you can basically take just the you know r, that's a vector which is giving. You know the rx component and the ry component. So that's triangle geometry. It means we know alpha, this if we take ry in this direction and rx in this direction, then ry over rx should be the tan of alpha. So we can recover alpha. Okay? And the same similar thing, you can basically figure out beta. And so, so where is that entire transformation which comes out of this in the end? Let me see. Yeah, this is my, okay, sine, uh, okay. So you get sine alpha short here, cosine alpha. He basically expresses everything in terms of components of Rx and Ry and Rz gets all these kind of triangle components or sine and cosine components going and from this basically plugs it all in here. So the, what, is, what is essentially important what we're going to do is we basically first rotate our vector R by a transformation in this alpha Sorry. It's Rz in alpha direction. Now alpha is because we're going in this direction has to be minus alpha. This puts us into this plane. Then we have to rotate negatively about beta. So this is y with minus beta. And now we have the r vector sticking up here vertically. Now we can, you know, we want to do a rotation about the z-axis with theta. So that is basically now shown here. Now comes actually, this is the only thing we want to do, okay? This is what we care about. This becomes now in the notation Rx theta. See? Good. Unfortunately, we did basically two rotations initially to get into this coordinate system. Now we have to undo them. This is basically what comes here. Now we rotate it back with beta, like it's plus beta, and then we rotate it back with plus alpha. Annoying, isn't it? So in order to do this entire scenario, we have to take R, rotate it such as it aligns with Z, then we can easily rotate about theta, and then we have to undo all that stuff so that we know where we are in the world coordinate system as we were originally. Kind of convoluted. But with this, sequence, you basically get a rotation around the vector r with angle theta. So now you get a little bit the, the, the misery of elementary rotation matrices, how you work your way through them in order to get where you want to get. That's basically alpha and, and, and beta appropriately. I did it before with doing the tan, but you can compose it into sine alpha and, and cosine alpha. And the same for beta. Okay, if you write out all those matrices, I missed the other two, it looks like this. Now he switches to a notation where instead of writing cosine and sine, he just writes C theta and S theta to make the notation smaller, otherwise this thing would kind of burst. Okay? Yes? What we did right now was a fixed angle rotation. Absolutely correct, yes. We could derive it in Euler angle rotation too. You know, you can derive that 
in many different ways. We don't have to align R with Z, we can align R with Y. You know, there is a whole bunch of possibilities. So much fun. Yes? Good. Um, let me just, yeah, let me forget about this for the moment. Quaternions. Now, what we right now derived was a rotation about the arbitrary vector r with angle theta. Quaternions, we express it, however, with rotation matrices in the standard way. Again, that you express r as a vector and the rotation angle theta in a way, but now you create a, a four vector. Okay. Now, do I know this all by heart? Um, yeah, it's basically an Rx, Ry, and R, let's see, Rz component, and it's multiplied with cosine or sine. I think here's, I don't know, so I'll make this up, but I think there's something like sine theta over two, and there is cosine theta over two. I think there's everything cosine <laughs> theta over two. Um, it's in the book. Hmm? It's in the book, I know. How did you find it? <laughs> you have it here? Good. So, that cosine, I'm good. <laughs> hmm? That is a matter of taste. <laughs> There's two notations. People like to have the vector of rotation in the lower three and the rotation angle on the upper one, and some other people turn it around. So there, there is unfortunately no clear convention. You need to know which convention someone is using. Okay. So, um, this four vector notation turns out to be transferable in something which is called a hypercomplex number. That's kind of cool. so basically a complex number which has a alpha, no, how, how does it work? Um, it has a real part, let's call it, no, let's call this alpha, and then it has plus beta times j plus gamma times, let's see, what comes j, let's make it i plus Another thing, let's take another Greek guy. Let's make it epsilon and that's this times ij, let's make it h, where the i, j, and h are all complex components of a, com of a hyper complex number. A hyper complex number has multiple imaginary parts. So that's the annoying part. Now, this is basically a complete different branch of, of, of math, which turns out to beautifully coincide with rotations. What's important is actually this quaternion Q has to be unit length. Otherwise, it's not going to work. <coughs> um, with this notation, you express the same as what we did here. But what you can do with it, and that is really what matters, you can do calculus with it really nicely. You can differentiate it to get velocity, that means angular velocity, or angular acceleration. And all this is beautiful. If you do this in based on Euler angle or fixed angle notation, it's way more complicated. So quaternions, if you do math in a robot, in the end, you do them in quaternions. If you want to get intuitions, you basically often reconstruct, you can basically take a quaternion and you can transform it into a rotation matrix very easily. And from the rotation matrix, even as you know what the columns mean, in terms of vectors, we have a better intuition. But the math is all done in the background in quaternions. But it's a little bit abstract and a little bit annoying. It has its own little rules which are not trivially derived. So basically how to take a quaternion and basically differentiate it, it has a special operator how to do that. Um, there's often that you have to do renormalization to ensure the quaternion remains unit length and things like that. But it's the right way of working with orientations. Everything else just becomes a mess.
Okay, now we have this, what's time doing? Um, we have those rotations. Um, there is something which is annoying if you want to do that. Um, if you get, someone gives you a rotation matrix R, which looks like that. The rotation matrix is actually a, a, a nice friendly thing. It's a, it's a clear operator which rotates something from A to B. And you don't have to worry about how it's been composed. But if you would like to decompose it into, for instance, an Euler angle or fixed angle rotation, you can do that. And it's a little bit annoying. What you have to do essentially is you take your, let me see whether he has it somewhere. Uh, I think it comes somewhere. It's here, Psilla. here we go. If you basically take a Euler angle notation and rotate about, um, no, this is, uh, about three different angles okay, in a particular way. This is basically showing you you're rotating for basically about some Z double prime, that means it's an Euler angle rotation, then about a Y prime, the Z notation. If you write it out in terms of all the rotation matrices, multiply them together, you get something like this. And if you wanted to recover based on this notation, some of the, uh, the, the rotation angles of the uh, individual rotations, you would have to basically look at these coefficients and try to figure out whether you can somehow recover angles. So let's look at this for instance. This is a matrix which is basically, again, multiplying out the elementary rotations of this Euler angle notation. Now it looks like a mess, but how could I, for instance, get a handle on the angle, what is that, psi? Well, I can basically look at this coefficient. So this is R31 and R32. And if I now take R32 and divide it by R31, okay? That means I divide the sine theta sine of psi divided by minus sine theta and cosine psi, okay? And it's nice since the sine components cancel and I get something which is the minus tan of psi and that I can recover. And that I can get this high angle uniquely recovered. So that's annoying. So you basically now, for the, in order to get the other angles, you would have to look at other opportunities how to do the same thing. So here's another opportunity here for phi. <coughs> and the last one becomes a little bit more complicated. You guys know what a tan two is? People use that. Um, if you need to recover an angle, the nicest function to do that is, is the can. So if you have basically, if you give you, if I give you a x and a y component and I want to get the angle between a, a, a vector, here's a vector, it has an x component and a y component. I want to figure out this angle. Now this is nice because I know that tan alpha equals y over x. And if I have y and x, so what is important, I like to have y and x. I don't want just to have a number, which is, I don't want this, this, this fraction be already solved and given to me as a number. Since I know if y is positive and x is positive, alpha has to be in the first quadrant. If x were negative and y is positive, alpha has to be in the second quadrant. And the same you can do for the third and fourth quadrant. So having knowledge about the sign of x and y uniquely tells me in which quadrant the vector is, so I don't get this ambiguity of that it's basically a vector could be maybe just the mirror image of itself. And I basically <coughs> determine that this here should be my angle house. Which I could. It's basically x. If I just give you the number x divided by y, then it's the same as minus x divided by minus y. No difference. So it means I wouldn't know whether I'm in this quadrant or this quadrant. If I know x and y, it's fine. So a tan 2, this function, takes two arguments, the x and the y part of the tan. And from that, automatically, all the computers can do that, gives you correct and a unique angle for this 
phi in this particular case. Make sense? Just something to keep in mind. Angles are annoying. Okay, that's why you try to also, whenever you, if you, if you resolve that and try to figure out an angle, if you can do something as a tan, it's great. You can always figure it out. If you just get something which is a cosine, then you can be in two different <coughs> quadrants. You, have a, you need to figure out how to resolve that afterwards. Okay, is that the end? Good, so I just need one more thing. And that is at the very beginning of this, oopsie. I want to add one last component, and this is what is called a homogeneous transformation. All we're going to add now is our offset. We've been talking only about rotation. Initially, I showed you the potato body, which was nice. Here's my potato guy. Local coordinate system, O prime. Local coordinate system, O. And I nicely had a vector from O to O prime. And then we basically said, oh, let's forget about O prime, this vector offset for a while, and just look up for our rotations. Now let's bring it back. So if you wanted to express a point, which is here, P prime, in this prime coordinate system, in world coordinate system, well, you basically have to do two things. You basically have to take the translation into account and the orientation change into account. And the well, nice formula here is now, in general, that if you have a vector P0, if you want a global coordinate from P1, you first rotate P1 from 1 to the 0 coordinate system, and then you add the offset, which they call O1 to 0 now, in general. Okay, so this is the complete transformation, how to go from a local representation of P to a global representation of P, <coughs> including an offset of the two coordinates. <coughs> the offset is trivial, it's just an offset vector. There's really no, no depth to that. Now, because these things happen all the time in robotics, people created a special notation to express that, and that is essentially a homogeneous transformation matrices, and these become now four matrices. We have four by four elements. And in the first, now we do this in a partition form. In this upper part, we get R1 to 0. Here, we get the offset vector, O1 to 0. Down here, we get a 1, and then we get the 0 there. And this multiplies now our vector in local coordinate system which is going to be P prime, in order to stick with this notation, we have to add a 1 in the fourth element of every vector. Right? Now you can try to well, if you <coughs> multiply this out. And you can just now, you can use it in partition form. That's kind of the nice thing about partitioning. So you basically partition here as well. So we get P1 multiplied by R10. That's essentially this term. Okay? And then get 1 gets multiplied by O10, we get added, which is this term. And then P1 in a product is with a zero vector goes to zero. And one multiplied with one becomes one. So we get beautifully this vector P0 out of that, just we have a one element in here at the bottom because it's now a homogeneous transformation matrix notation. Make sense? It's just basically a convention to basically mush the transformation and the rotation together. Good. This is actually what people like to use a lot in robotics, since then you don't think about translations and rotations so much anymore, you keep it together. There's one important component. If you, so this, this thing we call, what do we call it actually? Um, let me see, what notation does he use? A, okay, fine, it's A. So it's A from one to zero. And you put the squiggle on top of the vectors in order to make sure that's a four vector. You know that is a homogeneous transformation matrix notation. Important is if you um, want to take the inverse of a homogeneous transformation matrix, you cannot just apply an inverse operator. You have to invert it appropriately. 
so that actually the transformation makes sense. So that actually becomes that you invert the matrix, the true rotation matrix, and you basically pre-multiplied the inverted rotation matrix with this offset vector here. So the inverse is a structured inverse. It is not an algebraic inverse that would get, create a mess, wouldn't work. So this is the idea essentially where you create a slightly new way of doing algebra for a particular purpose. Now, we're pretty much at the end, but just to mention that there is an even more beautiful way of doing that. So you have basically, the first way is you just keep transformations and rotation separately and you have your rotation matrices and your transformation vectors. Second way is you do homogeneous transformation matrices, which becomes a four by four matrix or a four vector notation. And then there's something where you basically start to have six components, one, two, three, and one, two, three. So the first three ones are usually the orientation um, so orientation one, orientation two, orientation three, and then basically the point X, Y, Z. And so there's a six vector notation as well that is called spatial algebra. And with this, you can actually completely express dynamics and kinematics and rotations and everything, but you need to create your own algebra with it. So basically the transpose operator gets, has to be changed, the inverse operator has to be changed, all kinds of things have to be changed. And the beauty is that when you're done with that, and in case you understood all the things you've been doing, you can write robot dynamics and kinematics in an incredibly compact form. So the guy who did this is actually Roy Featherstone. He has a book on spatial uh, algebra for, for robot dynamics, or spatial robot dynamics, that's what it's called. It's gorgeous. If you really want to do and dive into things in compact notation, which is very efficient to program, that is the way to go. It's a pain in the rear end, to be quite honest, since you basically take about a couple of weeks before you can actually think in the way you think. It's really weird. So there's basically all kinds of abstraction of, of, of kinematics and robot dynamics. Quaternion is a simple way where essentially the mathematicians added a component. Um, going into spatial algebra is even more complicated. So what, what there's one thing essentially worth by mentioning here when it comes to rotation, what is annoying about life. The annoying thing is essentially a rotation, a, a, a translation is easy, it's just three points. I just need three coordinates and I know how to translate. A rotation should only take three quantities as well alpha, beta, gamma, or something like that. Unfortunately, we have not figured out a clean way how to do that. An alpha, beta, gamma has to be either fixed angle or the angle, and I have to know whether alpha, beta, gamma is x, y, z rotations, or maybe it's x, y, x, y, x, or God knows what. So I need to get this additional information. We don't have an efficient, what's called a minimal representation. We don't have a decent minimal representation for orientation. And the best thing people found is either quaternion, Q, which is actually a four vector. So it has one component to many. But we know that we have to normalize the vector, which takes the component kind of out again. But it's a little bit annoying. But this is the most compact representation where we can do everything we would care about with uh, orientation. And rotation matrices are also very pretty, but they, are, they have nine components. <laughs> Okay, they have nine coefficients in the matrix. That's a total overkill. And if you would do, you can do calculus with rotation matrix, we'll do this a little bit at some point. And, but you have to pay, pay, pay attention, it can quickly go out of hand that you also have to renormalize these rotation matrices. The rotation matrices are supposed to have determinant one, okay? If they don't do that anymore, then hell breaks loose. So orientations are pain, but we need them. We'll try to avoid them as much as possible so you get just a little bit of exposure to that. But it's one of the topics when you really work with a robot, you spend a fair amount of time with your fingers and thumbs and, and rotating and thinking and what this all means. All right. Thank you very much. That's it for today.
mám počas voľa? 